Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining me for this um, lunchtime presentation. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to Sonia for helping me with all the IT gremlins we've just been having to prepare this for you. Uh, the talk today is um, concerning breaking the chain of infection with antimicrobial copper. And I'm going to try and summarize the many years of work we've done uh, from superbugs to respiratory viruses. So why are we interested in copper? Well, copper has been known since ancient antiquity, and in particular, it's been as associated with good health, eternal life. So you may um, remember the Egyptian Ankh, that's the sign of eternal life in Egypt. Chinese medicine, they have the kanji symbol qi, which is increasing the flow of life energy. And the alchemists in medieval Europe, the planetary symbol for Venus, which protects against evil, was also the symbol for copper. So if we look back in ancient antiquity, it's been used, for example, um, in ancient Egypt for over 4,000 years. It was used to sterilize drinking water. Uh, and also the, the bronze swords of Egyptian uh, warriors after a battle, they would put the, the filings from the swords when they re-edged them into their wounds to heal them. Uh, Hippocrates in Greece recognized the medical benefits of copper and he, he used copper powders to treat leg ulcers related to varicose veins. The Aztecs, completely different continent and society, also used copper oxide and malachite for skin conditions. And some really interesting um, health effects have been recorded. So in France, um, round about 1850, we had the cholera epidemics, particularly in Par Paris, and all working groups were infected, except, interestingly, the copper workers who appeared to be immune to cholera. Um, more recently, um, in the USA, an American uh, clinician, Phyllis Kuhn, um, did a study in her hospital in Philadelphia where they'd replace brass doorknobs with more contemporary um, stainless steel, aluminium, what have you. And she noticed that E. coli numbers were low on the remaining brass doorknobs, but were very much higher on these newer materials. And she wrote a, um, a letter to an American uh, medical journal warning people that removing copper from a hospital might not be such a good thing. And then um, further on from there in India, there was a study done of drinking water containers where um, for 5,000 years, um, Ayurveda medicine had uh, advocated the use of tamrajal, which is the storage of drinking water in copper containers. And if you fill the brass containers with water, leave overnight and then drink the next day, it's beneficial for your health. And they've actually found very low numbers of E. coli in these waters when you actually look at the treated water. Now, in my own lab, we've spent many years looking, for example, um, at waterborne pathogens in biofilms. And when we look at biofilm formation on copper, we get reduced numbers of Legionella pneumophila, Helicobacter pylori, and E. coli O157, all of which are waterborne. We then also looked at foodborne pathogens on surfaces, so E. coli O157, yet again, it's called the burger bug historically, Salmonella and Listeria monocytogenes. All of these were rapidly killed on copper. We then moved on to hospital acquired pathogens and this advent of the superbug. So we've looked at MRSA, vancomycin resistant enterococci, Clostridium difficile, Acinetobalmanii, Klebsiella pneumoniae, MDM1, you name it, I think we've looked at it and they all die rapidly on copper alloy surfaces. Now, more recently, my lab has focused on viruses. So influenza, H1N1, norovirus, adenovirus, and I'll be mentioning coronaviruses during my presentation. 
And by the way, we've also looked at fungi such as Candida and Aspergillus species. Um, and again, they die on copper. And um, so copper has been advocated for use in high velocity uh, conditioning systems where um, fungal growth in these systems is a major problem. Now, the problems of healthcare are shown very nicely in this slide um, from healthcare acquired infections in the European Union. So if you see here that if you go into a hospital without an apparent infection, then uh, between five and 6% of the patients um, acquire an infection. So in the red, we've got the European Union average and in the dark, we've got um, England. So between five and 6%. But if you look particularly in the intensive care unit, patients, obviously they're a lot more susceptible to infection and there you'll see very big increases in um, obtain or acquiring a hospital acquired infection. So um, in England it could be up to 25 percent and certainly over 20 percent in the European Union. Now it's interesting in that um, in some European countries, uh, specific countries, you can get up to 51% prevalence of infection just from going into an intensive care unit in these countries. Now, we know, for example, that healthcare acquired infections causes over 5,000 deaths a year in the UK, 37,000 direct deaths in the EU, and over 100,000 deaths a year in the United States. So these are very large figures and it costs billions to treat these. Now, this is an old poster from the NHS. And does it remind you something that you're seeing much more recently? And it concerns the fact that uh, when we go about our daily lives, we are spreading pathogens through various routes, um, not least respiratory infections such as viruses. So here was a poster uh, a few years ago for the influenza epidemic around at the time. And as you can quite clearly see, this lady um, is on a bus and as she sneezes, the sneeze goes, it goes as respiratory droplets around the area. They land on their hands and they land directly on the grab rails. And this is why people are advised to wash your hands with soap and water or to use a sanitizer gel. So even then we were asking the question, how many times a day are contact surfaces cleaned? How frequently do people wash their hands? And to what extent do these contribute to dissemination of respiratory um, and fecal pathogens? So in my own lab, we've developed various model systems to look at survival of pathogens on touch surfaces. So in this one, we have our moist contact model. So as you can see here, this is a cough, and you can see the millions of particles which are being re um, released from micron sized up to thousands of microns in size. The, the micron size can um, survive in aerosols for long periods, whereas the very large droplets fall quickly onto touch surfaces. Now, this is another of the issues. One reason why people should always close the lid when flushing the toilet, you can see the aerosol which is being released. So th these are all um, ways in which we experience aerosols and droplets in our everyday lives and the risks they may cause. So some of the early experiments we did were, was looking at um, MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and we looked at survival on stainless steel and a variety of copper alloys. Now we also uh, were interested in um, silver because there have been many claims for antimicrobial silver um, as an antimicrobial surface. And when we put MRSA onto stainless steel or, or dry silver, 
then you'll see that over certainly a six hour period, there was no decrease in numbers. Whereas if we put those same um, bacteria onto copper, then we got um, a log seven kill in 40, 45 minutes. And if we used uh, the alloy, uh, brass, which is 70% copper, 30% zinc, we, get, we got complete inactivation um, in just over four hours. Now, this is what we call our moist test, where we use a 20 microliters inoculum. And when you spread that onto a surface, um, say a centimeter square, it can take between 20 and 30 minutes to completely dry out. And this kill rate is related to the rate at which the surface dries out. And this all comes down to the mode of how copper surfaces kill pathogens. And I'll come back to that again later. We also, not surprisingly, developed a dry touch surface model to simulate touching a push plate or a door handle as shown here. When we compare MRSA uh, on copper alloys, where we've got our moist method, uh, which you've just seen, against our dry method. Now here, we have, uh, we are, we're only adding one microliter of MRSA culture to the surface and spreading it out. So this dries out in just a few seconds. And now you'll see that the kill times are much faster. So if we look at copper, for example, here, we're getting a log seven kill in 20 minutes or less. Uh, when we look at alloys such as the brass, they take a little longer, 30 minutes, but certainly significantly less than the, the, uh, the four to five hours we showed with the moist respiratory droplets model system. So pathogens on a dry antimicrobial surface uh, certainly for copper, die a lot quicker. For silver, we, we don't believe silver works in the dry at all. It only works in the wet, for example, when you use the um, ISO 22176 test, where everything is kept wet for 24 hours. Now, what happens to bacteria on surfaces? Well, here's Pseudomasa rogenosa. We've looked under the um, electron microscope. And these are the bacteria on stainless steel after one hour of contact. And you'll see we have nice, um, healthy looking bacteria. But if you put them onto copper, you'll see the, the cells are collapsing. They're starting to rupture. And you can even see intracellular content spilling out. So copper attacks the cell wall of bacteria. Now, we've published many papers on this. And this is just a summary slide. So when a bacterium lands on a copper surface, it releases in particular copper one ion, and this can directly attack the cell wall. It inhibits the respiratory chain and it can get inside and it um, destroys the nucleic acid, DNA and RNA in bacteria. And we'll talk more about viruses in a minute. Now there's a secondary reaction, and this is the Fenton reaction. So most bacteria, um, when they respire, produce tiny amounts of hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide can react with copper one, and this op oxidizes the copper one to copper two, but it, importantly, it forms hydroxyl free radical. Now this is very reactive, and it's even faster at um, destroying cell walls and destroying nucleic acids. So it turns out that when a bacterium um, lands on a surface, um, a German lab has measured that within seconds, you can see a 200,000 times uptake of copper one into the cell, um, which attacks the cell. And so this is, you can liken to, for example, um, you've got a hole in a boat and it doesn't matter how fast you paddle or you bail, you can't get rid of these copper ions. 
So when people talk about copper transport systems and copper resistance, they're really talking about aqueous copper and um, genetic events where we're looking at um, uptake and export of copper at very low concentrations. Here we're talking of massive concentrations that have got into the cell. And as we say, we can get direct generation um, of, on the attack and also indirect through generation of reactive oxygen species, um, which happens much faster to give the kill. So let's move on to viruses. Um, these have obviously plagued us for a long time now. Um, there are no antibiotics against viruses. So in many ways, we've had to tough things out in epidemics unless there's been a vaccine. So every winter, of course, we all have to have a different um, vaccine because the virus keeps mutating. Now, a few years ago, we were interested to know what happens to influenza A on a copper alloy surface. So again, we compared our moist model, um, looking at respiratory droplets form, um, falling onto a contact surface, and our dry model simulating hand contact. And you'll see here that when we actually look, for example, at copper, we get um, rapid inactivation of the virus um, in just 20 minutes or so, and then on um, alloys such as copper nickel, um, cartridge brass, what have you, we also get quite rapid inactivation. And then other alloys of copper do work, but they take a lot longer to get this, in this case, a log six um, decrease in um, numbers of viable virus. And then when we looked at the, um, the hand contact, not only was copper giving this fast rate of inactivation, um, but also in this case, the copper nickel uh, was also very good. Um, and then several of the other alloys were also much better in the dry than they had been in the um, moist test. Um, the pink line up here is stainless steel. So you can see that flu virus survives very well on stainless steel, but not well on copper or alloys of copper, either as a moist respiratory droplet test or as a dry hand contact test. We then moved on to norovirus. This is frequently called winter vomiting virus, and it's the plague of hospitals in the winter. You can see um, a wave as hospitals, one by one, um, become um, infected by this virus and they have to close wards. It's a very tough virus um, compared to influenza. And in this particular diagram, you will see that we showed that norovirus will survive um, over 40 days, up to 50 days on a variety of non-copper surfaces, such as PVC, Teflon, ceramic, glass, silicone, rubber, um, and stainless steel, of course. And um, this is one of the reasons why you really do need to continually disinfect surfaces, wash your hands, what have you. Now, by contrast, when we put the norovirus onto um, copper alloys using our moist test, now in this case, rather than respiratory droplets, this is vomitus because it causes um, severe vomiting. And you can see that even though it's a tougher virus than the influenza A, we're still getting very good inactivation. Um, now, in this particular case, copper nickel as an alloy was even better than pure copper itself. Um, but also um, other alloys of copper were also good at reducing the numbers of norovirus. Now, when we um, looked at the, the dry hand model, now you can see everything is that much faster. So the copper nickels, the brass, the uh, pure copper are now um, inactivating the virus in just five to 10 minutes. 
So they're very effective. And uh, this is a nickel silver, takes longer, but, uh, certainly within two hours, we're getting a log five in activation and they're stainless steel. So again, confirm and it survives very nicely um, on that material. So what's going on with this virus? I should have actually shown you. So there's a picture of norovirus. Uh, all these things are always very difficult to see. It's what we call a non-envelope virus. So it doesn't use lipid from our own cells to coat itself. It's just a tough protein coat. Um, when the virus lands on copper, it contains RNA genetic material. And if you put the virus onto stainless steel and then um, recover the virus and isolate the RNA, you can see here, uh, not very well shown, I'm afraid, this band of RNA that we isolated from recovered virus. But when we put the virus onto brass and copper, there's nothing there at all. The um, viral RNA has been destroyed on the copper and the copper alloy. You can also look at the integrity of the capsid, this protein shell around the virus. So here's an electron micrograph picture. So there's the norovirus there on stainless steel at zero time and after um, many hours, hardly any change. There it's there on copper and it's already starting to clump together on the copper. So even as we add it at zero time and then recover, you can see something's going on. And then after just a few minutes on copper, you'll see that those particles have completely disintegrated. So the copper has destroyed the, um, the protein shell around the virus. So let's move on to coronaviruses. So when we did this work, this was 2015. Now at the time, the world had had two um, pandemics, the major one of SARS, which was in 2002, 2003, um, originated from China, uh, believed to be originally from that, that viral intermediate host. It's um, a coronavirus, and this is a picture you've seen already, um, of our more recent virus that I'll talk about in a minute, with these characteristic spikes forming this corona appearance around the virus. Um, so it's um, coronaviruses have been responsible for SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and in 2013-2014, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, again believed to come originally from bats, and probably um, via camels as an intermediate host. Hence why it got the name Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It was largely localized to the Middle East, but in fact some travelers did return to South Korea and they started um, a small outbreak there. And in fact, it's interesting, one of the reasons why South Korea is doing so well now against our new coronavirus is because South Korea was already prepared because of their previous response to MERS. Now, when you put um, the coronavirus we decided to investigate, which is um, strain 229E, so it's human coronavirus and it's a cause of the common cold, and it's closely related to SARS and MERS. And as you can see here, when you put this coronavirus onto non-copper surfaces, again, such as Teflon, PVC, ceramic, glass, silicone, and stainless steel, then the virus survives very well and will certainly um, persist for more than five days on these surfaces. Now, when we put the virus through our test models, so there's the, um, the moist uh, model simulating respiratory droplets falling on a surface. You'll see now that on various um, alloys of copper, the virus is completely inactivated 
in 20 minutes or so um, for many of the alloys. Um, and then when we put it through the dry test model simulating hand contact, now everything is very much faster as we've seen previously for norovirus and flu virus. So now on copper, even one or two minutes is all that's required to inactivate this virus, giving us a log three reduction. So what is going on in terms of virus integrity? Well, again, you can see this here. So under the electron microscope, so those are intact viruses on stainless steel. And if you look very closely, you can see here when we expand that picture up, you can just make out the corona of the spike proteins that aid attachment to human cells. But when we put them onto copper, now we see that the virus particles, which are normally round about 100 microns in size, are starting to reduce in size. And you can see they're starting to fragment here. So similar to the norovirus, um, copper is attacking the cell wall of the virus and making it fragment. So we can again investigate what happens with the RNA. Uh, we can look at this in two ways. We can look at the, the RNA genome itself and um, there's the genome isolated from virus on stainless steel and um, you can see that we've got a nice intact um, genome and that's also true um, on copper and brass at zero time but after two hours we've lost um, the RNA on copper and brass but it's still there on stainless steel and it's still there after four hours and that's just um, a control of purified virus RNA. Now, you can also look at copy number. So in this case, we looked at the NS4 gene in the coronavirus and then used RT-QPCR. And as you can see here, we're looking at the, the copy number of recovered virus. And so this is the copy number we start off with. So there's copper, brass, stainless steel. And within two hours, the, that particular gene has almost dis, disappeared. Intermediate survival on brass, and very good survival on stainless steel. And there's four hours further reductions of that gene. So very good evidence that copper is destroying the RNA of coronavirus. So at this point, um, ward trials will be taking place all over the world in terms of can we install copper alloys into a hospital and um, reduce um, numbers of bacteria on surface, for example. So when these studies were done in the red stars here, um, measuring bio burden, you can see that in countries such as the UK, France, um, Spain, North Africa, South Africa, um, as you can see going along here, um, we're getting 90% reduction in numbers of bacteria recovered from a copper alloy surface compared to a non-copper surface in a hospital environment undergoing routine cleaning. And this has also been uh, shown in Japan and Australia um, and South America. Um, of course, this is all well and good to say you're reducing bacterial numbers, but the big question is what happens to infection rate? So my colleague, Michael Schmidt, um, led a US Department of Defense um, study and they looked at what happens when you put copper alloys into three hospitals in the USA, two in New York and one in Charleston. And what they found, uh, which was a big surprise to people, was that they were able to show using independent statisticians that there was a 58% reduction in infection rate. Now, this really shocked many, many people. And they thought there must be something wrong, the statistics were wrong, 
there was something, you know, no one expected this. So um, these are the data they got. These were the healthcare acquired infections before they put copper in, and those were the percentage of infections after they put copper in. And you can see the probability of these statistics there. Now, since then, another study has been done. Uh, the pediatric unit in Norfolk, um, Virginia, and there they use uh, copper alloy touch surfaces, but also they use uh, copper fabrics for bed linens, for example. And they reported, so this is completely independent, independent of Michael Schmidt studies, they reported over a 68% reduction in multi-drug resistant bacteria and also Clostridium difficile. And I was very pleased because we'd shown that copper um, killed C. difficile in one of our studies many years ago. And a study is also taking place now in Los Angeles to see if they can also get similar reductions in infection rates. So now we come on to the, um, the pathogen of the moment, shall we call it, SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's another coronavirus, as you can see again in the classic picture. It was, um, it causes the disease, COVID-19, which stands for coronavirus infectious disease, um, isolated in 2019. It was first um, found in um, Wuhan in China, associated with the wet market selling a whole range of um, live animals to the population um, for basically food. Um, Chinese scientists, when they realized there was this new disease, isolated and sequenced the virus, and it was subsequently termed SARS-CoV-2 because of its similarity to the original SARS that I mentioned that occurs in, in 2002. Uh, to 2004, uh, and also to MERS 2012. Again, it's believed it originated from bats via an intermediate host. Some people have suggested this is pangolins, which are quite an exotic species in Asia. Now, um, I went on the web uh, the other day, and so far, SARS-CoV-2 causing COVID-19 has killed almost 1.5 million people around the world, and it's known to have infected 64 million people, probably much, much higher, higher for people who don't even report that they've had an infection. Um, it's easily transmitted as respiratory droplets, capable of surviving in air and on surfaces for long periods. So um, there's airborne spread and also via fomites, so here's a recent um, Department of um, Health um, picture showing what happens when someone is just um, breathing or speaking in a room. They're not smoking tobacco or anything. This is just their respiratory vapor being released. So hence the gov UK government's um, urging people to follow hands, face and space. Wash your hands wear a face mask and keep two meters distance to um, keep away from this um, respiratory plume, but also washing your hands, particularly for when you touch surfaces where these droplets have landed. So in my lab, uh, fortunately, we were equipped with a containment level three laboratory so we've been spent this year working with a variety of UK and international companies to assess the antiviral activity of their products against this new virus. And so we've been helping them optimize the assessment of antiviral hand rubs to replace ethanol. This does cause drying and irritation. And if you use it repeatedly through the day, many people do report um, ill effects from using it. And of course, um, assessment of fomites. So these would be typically metal surfaces, glasses, and even um, wrapping paper, because there have been concerns about what happens 
when you received parcels in the post? Are the outside of these contaminated during the packing and postage procedures? So for our assessments, um, you may well be aware that um, RT-PCR to detect the viral RNA has got limitations. And the principal one being the inability to differentiate live infectious virus from dead virus, or even residual RNA, which has spilled out of the virus and can survive actually for long periods in the environment. It, we need an infectivity assay. So my lab, like many others, has been using the Vero E6 cell, E6, uh, kidney cell assay. And we use this, these cells to culture the virus. And then after we recover the virus inocular from the treated test surfaces, we then um, quantify, these, um, quantify the surviving infectious virus in a visible plaque assay. Here's Catherine in my lab who's the stalwart doing uh, all of the work, you'll see she has to work in um, a class three cabinet. This is very tedious, it's uncomfortable, and it's one reason why assays for this virus take a lot longer than working with lower rated pathogens, viruses and bacteria. It also means the work costs a lot more money. But when we use the plaque assay, so these are the Vero E6 cells that have been stained with crystal violet. Now, normal healthy cells take up the virus and they all stain blue. But if the cells are infected with virus, they die. And you now get these clear plaques because the dead cells don't take up the stain. So you get a series of plaque forming units which you quantify and then report in terms of numbers of original inoculum versus numbers of survivors. Um, I just want to summarize the work we've done with one of the companies we've helped this year. And so we've been looking at survive, survival of this coronavirus on um, a novel copper coated surface. And um, this is working with a company called Copper Cover limited and they've got a process where they use pure copper powder and it's coal sprayed at high pressure onto different surfaces stainless steel aluminium they can even coat um, plastics um, this process forms a bond with the base material it turns out this is stronger than a weld and it produces a permanent antimicrobial coating so here's some examples uh, on their website. So there's a push plate, for example, and there's various types of door handle that they've um, coated. So when we looked at um, SARS-CoV-2, and you put it on stainless steel, and as we already knew, um, it survives very nicely. And here we're just showing you experiments over um, the 30 minutes. We've actually done this for um, several days. But when you put them on to copper, so in this case, so this is this uh, it's coated stainless steel. Now, within one minute, we get complete inactivation of those 550 plaque forming units. Uh, now, this is using our dry hand test. And you, as you'll see, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, again, nothing can be recovered. Now, when we use our moist test to simulate respiratory droplets, so this is a slightly larger volume, now you'll see that it takes a little longer, but now it takes 10 minutes to get complete inactivation of virus. So that's a 3.5 um, log drop in numbers. Um, so it appears to be working very well. Now, some of you may have seen the literature where the government and others um, report that coronavirus survives at least five days on uh, non-copper surfaces. Um, that's perfectly true. We've shown it, and in fact, our 2015 coronavirus paper also 
clearly showed it. Now, where we differ with this um, cited work, it comes from a US government laboratory, um, is that they claimed that when SARS-CoV-2 lands on copper, it takes four hours to inactivate. Now, we've looked at this very closely. We don't believe it. We think there's a technical error in their assay that I'm not going to bother explaining today. But certainly the results we get with SARS-CoV-2 shows rapid inactivation on various types of copper. I've only shown you one today. And this, is, uh, this um, strongly supports the work we published on coronavirus 229E back in 2015. So what next for our work with SARS-CoV-2? Well, we'll continue working with UK and international companies to attest the antiviral activity um, of their products against SARS-CoV-2. We're in discussions with supermarkets um, about um, applying antimicrobial copper touch surfaces, perhaps to trolley handles, door and refrigerator handles, refrigerator handles, what have you. Uh, we're also speaking to care homes at the moment. But I'd like to finish with this caveat. Don't forget antimicrobial resistance. This was our big issue until the start of this year when COVID-19 started to manifest itself. If I can remind you, um, last year and in the previous few years, uh, the O'Neill report of 2016 identified that antimicrobial resistant superbugs will kill as many as 10 million people um, by 2050. So that's one person dying every three seconds, and it's going to um, cost over $100 trillion. So we think COVID-19 is a problem, but once that is out of the way, we have got to readdress antimicrobial resistance. It's um, an, a persistent, ongoing problem. The good news is that we've shown that if they land on copper, copper alloys, they will die. So finally, acknowledgements. Many people have been involved in our copper work um, at Southampton. Um, these are some of the people involved. But I'd particularly like to um, highlight Catherine Bryant, who's doing the sterling work in that um, class three cabinet that I showed you the pictures of. Uh, and also to Harold Michaels from the Copper Alliance, um, who's given, uh, given us a lot of advice over the years on copper metallurgy. Uh, and I'd like to um, thank all the various companies um, who funded us and I'll just um, mention the Copper Alliance and Copper Cover, whose work I mentioned um, today. So thank you for listening.